and hi everybody. Welcome to Insights 2021. Is e-commerce the future of shopping? As Phil mentioned, I'm Katie Gross. I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at real-time market research platform Suzy, and we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands, helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers, both qualitatively and quantitatively, to help companies drive business decisions. And I'm really excited for today's discussion. It's featuring Tara Dunn from Colgate, and we're going to chat through all things e-commerce. So let's get to know each other a little bit better first. Tara, would love to, to have you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career to date. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Tara Dunn, and I've been in the retail industry for, oh, goodness, close to 30 years. Uh, the first 15, first half of that, I spent actually at the retailer. So everything from being a cashier to a store manager to a buyer to running category management. And then the last 15 plus years, I've been on the CPG side working for Colgate and have spent most of that time in analytics doing category management with a different array of retailers. That is awesome. So diving a little bit further into, into a little bit about you, you joined Colgate just over a decade ago. What brought you to Colgate the brand specifically? And can you share a bit more about the roles that you held at Colgate over that time? Yes. Um, you know, I just really wanted to do the full 360. So I had done retail, I had done buying and really wanted the experience on the manufacturer side. And um, Colgate was always a great partner for me when I was behind the desk and um, an opportunity arose to help lead our, it was a new team then, but it was essence the dollar channel. Um, I think we all are very familiar now with the dollar channel. It's a big beast out there, Dollar General, Family Dollar, Dollar Tree. Um, so yeah, so I've been doing a multitude of different roles predominantly on, on that channel over the years. So um, just different roles. Yeah, that's great. Um, great that you got to experience kind of so many sides of the, the retail mm -hmm. channel. Could you walk us through some of the kind of you know high level overview of changes in the role of consumer insights and the role of category yeah. management over that time period? Yes. Um, you know, I know when you guys asked me to be a part of this panel, you know, I definitely started kind of reminiscing of how it mm -hmm. used to be. And and I think back of, you know, even my days in the store. Um you know, the retailer really seemed to have more of the power. Um, just because it, it, if a shopper came in the store and they wanted to buy a gallon of milk and they wanted the lowest price, it was they just had to have faith that wherever they were, that's what's the lowest price. And I think the biggest thing is, is that mm -hmm. the shopper has now become kind of the king. And, you know, the cell phone and the internet has just made it, I, I mean, it's just, it's just changed the world we live in. Um, of all ages, you know, it doesn't matter if they're, you know, five or 85, just, you know, that it has definitely changed. And, you know, folks can be in a store and they can, you know, grab, pick up their cell phone and they can easily see, you know, what's the best price, what are the reviews? Um, I mean, there's just so much information now that are, is readily available. And I think just, you know, over the past, even really 15 years, you know, that has changed and, and, we're just having to adapt so much faster and so much quicker and it, and it's just yeah it's and then last year COVID hit I mean in, in 2020 just I think threw us all in in a little bit of a, a tizzy so we're all pivoting <laughs> flexing and trying to change and learn and grow and just a lot of different adjectives and verbs I could use I guess <laughs> yeah um, yeah We'll definitely get into a lot more details about the last year um, specifically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd love to know a little bit more about you know the role of so you've mentioned obviously a significant amount of changing mm -hmm. um, that happened yeah. with the consumer. How has the role of therefore of the category management role and the consumer insights role changed and adapted over that same time frame in order to keep up with the consumer changes? Yeah, um, I, I just think the the pace at which we can gather trends and and project out the future I, I think has changed the most and um you know i'll, I'll get on my my suzy my suzy mm -hmm. box for a minute i mean I've, I've worked on a lot of tools over my career um you know analytical tools insight tools web-based tools um and last year was our our first you know my first experience with suzy and and it was it honestly it was a, just a game changer because it, it's really allowed that virtual world allowed us to gain insights 
for whoever our customer is really quickly. Um, and that has been a game changer where, you know, I think five years ago, if my one of my customers wanted insights in, you know, how to change, you know, a category of flow, ag adjacencies, insights, anything, you know, it was typically, you know, it could be upwards, you know, three, four months before we could really get the insights and the nuggets to present back to the retailer. And, and I think with this digital world that we live in, you know, time is of the essence. We don't have six months to gather those insights anymore. Um, so I, I think that's been a big game changer, you know, is, is these virtual platforms that allow us to get very specific insights specific to our individual retailers much faster than we used to. And I, and I think that's been, for me at least in my career, has been the biggest, the biggest change. Yeah, that's excellent. Thanks for sharing. We'll come on to more details about you know, the specifics of your use of agile tools as we go through the chat. Um, mm -hmm. But let's dive into what is one of the most interesting habits <laughs> you've seen change amongst consumers in the last year? Uh, I love asking this question. It's always fascinating to me. Yeah, um, you know, I, I saw that on the question and, and I thought I would use just a personal experience. Um, you know, I have I have older parents and, um, you know, they they've always been very anti-internet shopping online you know i'm going to the store i'm going to buy my stuff and um i was just a few months i mean you know, as we got through covid and i actually got down to florida to see my parents you know my father-in-law now is doing so much shopping online I, I mean it's just crazy um we bought him one of those alexas you know five years ago the man never used it never used it and then i'm down there you know a couple of months ago and he said something he goes yeah i ordered it on amazon i said oh you did he goes i did and he goes hang on alexa can you please tell me when my such and such will be delivered i would have never in my lifetime thought i would have seen my 81 year old father talking to his alexa asking about an order that he placed online so um you know i, I think that would you know yeah. and that's very different <laughs> Indeed, it's almost like the technology's become so much easier because yes, yeah. trying to teach my parents how to use a laptop and a phone was difficult, but telling them to just talk into this machine is very easy. <laughs> so it has become easier, except my 70 year old father calls it Amanda and she doesn't listen. <laughs> so he's like, Amanda, turn the lights off and they don't go <laughs> off. <He's, laughs> he can get very confused. And so, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so thinking about e-commerce, let's get some uh, into some of the specifics. Obviously, as you mentioned, COVID really sped up the uh, the e-commerce revolution that we were already um, moving towards. Could you share a little bit more information about the kind of the shifts in Colgate shopper habits that you saw across all sorts of categories over that past year? Um, yeah. Um... It, and it's it's a range, right? So I mean, some of your, your typical brick and mortar stores are just way more advanced than than some of the the smaller stores. So um, mm -hmm. it, it again, it's just about flexing and and being able to be agile and helping your customer in any way you can. You know, where you have a Walmart and an Amazon, you know, they're very sophisticated. They've you know they've been embracing this digital online ecom platform. And then some of the smaller retails, you know, are a little bit behind and they're and they're trying to catch up. And and that's where, you know, as a manufacturer, you know, we're trying to leverage our insights and, and our e-com to, you know, help help in that area so that, you know, they can continue to be, you know, you know, competitive in this marketplace. So, you know, it's it's yeah, it's not a one size. I wish I could just give one specific mm -hmm. answer, but it's it's just so broad and it's so different and for each customer that we have and um it's just not a one size fits all anymore but you know e-com is definitely i think for all of us on this call every every company whether you're you know a retailer or a manufacturer you know, even different industries you know real estate everything is so digital now um i mean just you know i told you earlier you know buying a house you know i'm buying a house basically online i mean it's e-com i'm buying a house online so you can buy anything online you can buy your tube of toothpaste you can you know buy a car now so um but yeah you know categories that i didn't you know that were really more typical brick and mortar you know most people did go to brick and mortar to buy toothpaste or cleaning supplies 
And then post COVID, you know, we have definitely seen a surge in our e-com sales um, across all of our different retailers, across all of our different brands. So. Yeah, yeah, you do raise a really good point though. It's, it, it's not just in CPG that we've seen in the e-commerce trend. I, I bought a house actually right before COVID, December of 19. Um, and I had bought a house maybe seven years prior to that. I remember having to go to lawyers' offices and signing documents and so on, but this time around, everything was digital. Signatures were digital, the bank transfers were digital. I didn't have to go to see anybody, do anything, go to the bank and have to do anything. It was all digital. So there's a lot to learn, I think, from other adjacent industries, not just within CPG. Yeah, exactly. Um, remembering kind of the, the early days of COVID also, how did you um, help your partners adapt quickly in those early days? And also you and I talked about earlier, um, stock and things being in stock was a little bit of a challenge um, in those, some of those early days as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I mean, again, speaking from personal experience, um, not just me personally, but, you know, in my role, um, you know, people were desperate to get certain products, whether it was, you know, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, liquid hand soap, you know, all those things. So, you know, I think people would go to their traditional brick and mortar, and then when they were out of stock, they didn't want to take the risk or take the, the safety, you know, the chance of going out. So people just started ordering online. And I think it was just almost desperation. It was, okay, I'll go to Amazon first. Okay, well, Amazon doesn't have it. I'll go on to this retailer.com and see if they have it. So I think just the whole supply and demand and then all the, you know, just, it just created, you know, I don't, I don't know, the, you know, the right words to articulate, but you know, it did, it did kind of just create people out of, you know, a, you know, they just needed these products that they were desperate and they were willing to do whatever they needed to do to get on it. I mean, people were buying stuff on eBay. I mean, it was, it was, it was a little bit nuts. It was a crazy time. I never thought in my career I would see something like we saw last year. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of our clients had said that it was really a kind of once in a generation opportunity to capture new brand users and new brand loyalty um, of some kind. And uh, I'm hoping we don't get to see this again. Yeah, me either. <laughs> um, and so now thinking about how we're entering really a, you know, a post-COVID world, um, do you think a lot of those consumer habits will remain? What are your thoughts on how this, or have you seen anything so far in the last month or two since vaccines have become so strong around changes to the consumer um, behavior? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, looking into some of the tools that we have, you know, available to us, you know, just looking at some of those behaviors and we, we are seeing, some, you know, folks returning to the brick and mortar, but still see, um, still seeing growth in, in e-com, I mean, substantial growth in e-com. So um, I, I think it'll be a mix. I don't think it'll ever go back to what it used to be. I think e-com is here to stay. Um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I think it's just going to continue to be a bigger part of pretty much everybody's in the industry, a bigger piece of, you know, bigger piece of the pie for them. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and obviously e-commerce giants like Amazon, Instacart, etc., cetera, are making it increasingly easy for us to purchase, adding standard day-to-day -day items onto sure. subscription models um, and so on. Has that been a particular trend and how has that impacted your consumer base to kind of move towards subscription bases and and which can be both a blessing and a curse, I'm sure. Yeah, a blessing, yeah, exactly. Um yeah, I'm trying to think of what a good answer would be. <laughs> you know, but still being um you know, I, I do think it does help. I do think it does, especially the subscription and save, I think it does create a little bit more loyalty. I think it's, it's, it's good for the brands, right? Cause then it's, it, you're not, you're just taking that item off the list and people are just getting it automatically and they don't think about it. Um, yeah, it's where when, if you don't do the subscription or you're buying online, then, you know, you go to brick and mortar. And I think folks, you know, consumers can be a little bit more tempted, I guess, by, what they see on the shelf and they go, like, oh, you know, depending on what kind of mood they're in, what type of retail environment they're in, you know, what video or TikTok video they just watched, it may entice them to maybe try something new. So I, I you know, the click and save and the subscriptions I, I do think are, are good for brand loyalty. 
Um, I think of myself as, as you know, even that shopper um, pre-COVID, you know, I bought all my pet food, I would go to the store. And now I just do it all online. I do it on Chewy. They just deliver to the house. I don't think about other brands. I don't, you know, it's just what I have set up is what I get. It's what I what ships to the house and, and I don't think about it. So even from my own perspective, it has it has created even more brand loyalty with some of the items that I buy when I've done when I do a subscription. Yeah, yeah. It certainly felt like you could get last year in the last year everything online i focused on my home and my backyard as i'm sure many people did and i was having plants delivered from garden centers to my door didn't even have to to go to buy my own rose bush it was being delivered mm -hmm. um you you mentioned brand loyalty there and obviously subscription models and so on could you talk a little bit more about kind of name recognition and brand recognition as it comes to, as it pertains mm -hmm. to e-commerce shoppers and really the role of kind of brand loyalty and, and the connection to e-commerce um, oh. <laughs> I think we're all out there fighting for it. Um, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't have just one answer. I feel like I'm not being very helpful, but you know, it's it just, yeah. you know, it's how, you know, as, as for us, it's how do we get, how do we get our, when people go do a, a search on toothpaste, you know, how do we ensure that regardless of what site they're on, you know, Colgate comes up first. Um, you know, so those are the things that, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to, to improve and to be best, but, you know, it, it's almost like brick and mortar, right? It's like not everybody can be at eye level. When you go to the store and you look at the shelf, not everybody can be at that eye level, but it's always everybody's trying to, you know, figure out how do I get best placement? How do I get the items I want and, you know, on the shelf and available for my shopper? And it's, it's kind of that same thing on e-com, but it's 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 definitely more challenging because the shelf is unlimited, right? It's it's not like you're just dealing with you know a 16 foot set planogram. I mean, you're in this virtual world where it's just everything. So um, I, I would tell you we don't we don't have it figured out 100%. You know, we continue to invest, we continue to do research, we're continuing to to improve and you know, that's, I think we're, we're all in this together. <laughs> Some are doing better than others. So, but it's just, how do we keep learning and keep moving forward? Yeah. So switching gears into that exact topic <laughs> around <laughs> consumer insights and how are you learning? Um, you've obviously mentioned uh, uh, that you had started using Suzy over the last year. I'm sure you're using many other um, agile research tools. How have you leveraged those new tools to really gain the insights to help you stay on top of the consumer? Um, during this time, are there any kind of specifics you can share around? Uh, first of all, kind of why you adopted the the um, the platform. Yeah, I think the biggest reason, you know, that I I found the Suzy tools so um, useful, at least for me um, and our team, was you know we we do deal with the Dollar Channel, um, so it is a little bit different consumer. It's you know it's a, it's a very small box. It's limited assortment. It's you know typically you know a lower income shopper. Um, you know, we have some stores that are just very urban. We have some stores that are very, you know, rural. And it, and whenever we would go in to, you know, have a meeting with our customer, they were always asking questions about, you know, well, how does, how does that resonate with my shopper? How does that, you know, how will my shopper respond? Um, so it was being able to kind of find these very quick nuggets of insights that would be relevant to our shoppers to help them, right? So. Um, Susie was just, you know, it was one of those tools that I could easily, you know, have a meeting with my retailer. They could ask me some questions and say, hey, I got a tool that I can use that I can tap into your shopper and I can answer those questions for you. And I can do it relatively quick. Like I can get this turned around into you in five days. And they're like, five days? And I'm like, yes, literally, like even maybe less than five days. So it's just, I mean, we've used it for, I mean, just, oh my goodness, the number of questions that I've posed out there is, it just, it's such an array, anywhere from, you know, during COVID asking the question, you know, what are the top benefits in liquid hand soap you're looking for? Is Annie back like the most important thing to you? Mm -hmm. And then even looking post COVID, you know, tapping into those shoppers going, is Annie back still the number one thing you're looking for in hand soap? And then, 
you know, that just helps drive distribution at their store and making sure, you know, if Annie back was, was sounding what their shopper wanted, then we could bring them solutions that were really grounded in Annie back properties um, that would help serve that need for that shopper. I mean, and then there's been packaging and there's been scents and, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's been, it's been very useful, I would say. And it's been like a, just across all different things from cleaning to hand soap to toothpaste to so, and it's been very well received by, by the customer. Yeah, that's wonderful. And in fact, um, I know that really, you know, over the last year, we've heard from a lot of our clients that the role of insights has really started to become a central function at the business. Have you seen a similar trend with your company? Um, yes, everything, you know, centers around the shopper, right? Everything goes back to the shopper and, and, and what they want. Um, you know, the tricky thing is, is shoppers are now so individualized, you know, it's not mm -hmm. just one thing and, and it serves the needs. It's, you know, how, how do you resonate with this group of people and how do you resonate and bring a message to this group of people and, and still, you know, make everybody feel included but still be able to be very individual to them. I, I think shoppers do like people, like they, they want to feel like you are speaking to them directly. And that's, uh -huh. that's challenging, that's, that's challenging. So, um, you know, I, I think digital is, is a way for folks to better connect on an individual basis. Um, but again, it's still, it's hard, right? It, it's a hard thing to do, so. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's why I'm iterating on those, on those, on those research projects and reiterating and targeting different segments and different consumers, not just, you know, age and gender demographics, but also on behavioral demographics and mm -hmm. trends and so on. It's yeah, it's a, it's a wide, <laughs> wide open world. Yeah. Yes, um, you think something like toothpaste, we all have teeth, we all need to clean our teeth, but it's not, not at all the same drivers that go into it. No, exactly. Um, how have you been democratizing research across the organization so that everybody at Colgate Palmolive Palm has access to that kind of consumer insights? Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, we, you know, we have a team and they, they do do the, a lot of insights for us. And then, you know, the teams, the, each individual team also has the opportunity to do some you know, like, like on my team, you know, I've been able to utilize the Suzy platform to gather insights that are very specific for my shopper. But if I need more macro, um, more bigger picture insights, then yes, we can, you know, go to the, the insights team and, and get those nuggets from them. So it's just really all of us, you know, working together. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in from the audience that I can already see here. Just trying to read through a couple of those. Um, one of them is how have you used agile tools to inform packaging specifically and, and what's that process look like? Obviously, you know, changing packaging is, is quite a big uh, undertaking and adding, you mentioned claims such as anti back Could you tell us a little bit more about that type of research you've been do, conducting into packaging? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm in, in the customer development organization, so I'm more on the ground out in the field with our customers. You know, so a lot of the packaging research, you know, is really done by marketing, you know, at, at a mm -hmm. higher level. But, you know, where we've been able to use agile tools is, you know, they're in order to differentiate themselves, we'll get the customers that would say, you know, hey, could you do an exclusive for us? Could you do, you know, a certain variant for us? Um, so we, we will, you know, work with the marketing teams. And there are times when, you know, and I know all manufacturers do this. Um, but you can, you know, you again use the tool to to test some packaging um, virtually. So um, I'll just speak from my own personal experience. That's all done by marketing, and you know that would be more their level of expertise. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, another question that comes in from the audience: How is Colgate using insights to inform your social media strategy, if that's even your area? For example, Not are you using area. TikTok? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> not my area, but yeah. I do follow all of our stuff. I mean, you know, we have Instagram and, and Facebook and all the different social Twitter, you know, all the social media platforms. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, so again, not my my area of expertise. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I actually did see an article today that you had just launched a sonic 
brand, if that's right, there's a, a YouTube video that um, explains the research that you had conducted into the sound of Colgate, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, especially as it pertains to social media and TikTok and you know, the importance of music and, and sound mm -hmm. itself. So sonic yeah. branding, I think, is probably going to be a key trend. Um, looking at uh, a couple of the other questions here. So um, what is the number one thing that brands must get right when they're starting an e-commerce strategy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I, I think with anything, you just have to kind of create your, your roadmap and you've just got to stick to it. So I, I think a lot of times what people will do and, and uh, you know, and, and again, this isn't just me specific to Colgate. This is just more in general. I think with e-commerce, um, just anything digital, it's just changing so fast. I think sometimes we get impatient and we don't wait to see if things are going to stick, right? That it's going to work. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that's a little bit of it too, is, you know, define your path, define your roadmap, but then you've got to give, you know, it's, it's, I have found at least with e-commerce that sometimes it's a little difficult to track and to really see if it's working. Um, so sometimes I think we get a little impatient and we change, you know, we pivot before maybe sometimes we need to. Um, again, you know, I don't think there's a, a, a one shot answer for this. It's just, I think it needs to be top of mind for everybody, Ecom. I think there, everybody should have some type of strategy and, and uh, you know, it's gonna be what works best for each individual. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, do you have any kind of talking points on the club channel growth potential? So another question that came in from the audience, yeah. uh, specifically as it kind of pertains to Costco, Sam's, BJ's, and, and what the kind of growth potential is of, of those companies and, and any potential e-commerce strategy? Yeah, I think, you know, if anybody, you know, anybody that has access to any type of data, you know, you can definitely see that those channels are growing um, across all of them. And, and I think at least, the insights that I have seen and that I've been able to gather is, you know, that club is that club will continue to grow. And, you know, part of that reason is it just limits the amount of time people have to be out, right? I think people got used to, you know, I don't want to go out to brick and mortar four or five times, you know, a week or I mean, you know, whatever, a couple times a week. So I think because of COVID, we we saw a lot of growth in the club channel, um, mm -hmm. just across the categories we compete in. Um, and I, I think, you know, personally, I, I think club growth is is here to stay. I, I think it's it's going to continue to grow. Yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned, people don't want to be out in lots of different stores. A neighbor of mine actually was buying garden furniture at Costco mm -hmm. and her food at Costco and clothing at Costco and shoes and camping yep. equipment mm -hmm. and want literally a one stop shop for everything. Mm -hmm. I noticed they're also driving a lot into pharmacies. You actually don't have to be a Costco shopper to go to the Costco pharmacy and We've all been in pharmacy a lot of the last year, so I think that's also probably driving some of the growth also. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience, which is related to Gen Z, obviously Gen Z being really important to, to many brands to capture that kind of brand loyalty yeah. early. Um, what, are you doing anything specific to appeal to Gen Z? Are their shopping habits and trends kind of any, any different as a cohort? Um, you know, I, I have a Gen Z in, in my house, so I would have to say yes, they are very different. Um, you know, I, I, you know, the insights again that, that I have, that I'm, you know, they're not, they're not quite as brand loyal. They, they want to be a little bit different. They, you know, um, I, like I said, I, I just think of my own Gen Z that lives here and, and her friends and, and they just have, you know, just a very different mind frame. You know, they just have different, you know, just a little, like my daughter, she, she just shops for everything online. Like everything, everything is an app. Like the least amount of human contact, I think for for her group of friends is good. Like, you know, they, they order their Chick-fil-A on their phone. They, you know, they, they order their coffee on their phone. They do their shop for their clothes on the phone. I mean, so yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's a tough group. And, and they switch, like what may be her favorite stuff today isn't her favorite stuff tomorrow so 
it's it, it is a very difficult group to to tap into is what i'm seeing um again just from my own personal experience um so yes we do have you know specific strategies by the different generation groups and and you know we're trying to make sure that when we're looking at innovation that we're keeping the different groups at, at the forefront because you know what a baby boomer buys is not not what a gen z is going to buy and so yeah you do have to it's what i mean it's just it's so it's just such a different world we live in right now it's just very different <laughs> yeah and in a short space of time i feel i moved to new york seven years ago and i loved parading through soho with my bloomingdale's bag and my starbucks <laughs> coffee cup and i was a walking ad for everybody now yeah. <laughs> lots of bags it felt fun to come home with lots of bags to open yeah. up and, and cut labels off things um and so on and it's such a short space of time that, that has completely turned on its head yeah it, it really has and you know like i said i i you know trying to keep this a little bit more specific to my own personal experience um but yes it's just it is very different you know you and and everybody on the phone if in this business and just think about your own family dynamic about how your parents shop versus how you shop versus maybe even how your kids shop and you know it's very different than what it used to be i mean i think back when i was a kid you know my mom shopped how my grandmother shopped and you know like but it's almost like the Gen Z group almost wants to be different, you know, like it's just, it's, again, there's no, there's no magic formula. I, I wish I could stand here and give people a magic bullet, but it's, it's, there isn't one. That's what I've learned for the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, a great question just came in also. Um, how can we improve the experiential shopping experience through e-commerce? I know that stores did a lot around this, um, but how do we kind of adapt to that in an e-commerce space? Um, everything's about making it easier, right? You know, it's it's just how do you keep it simple but still relevant? Um, you know, I, I you know just think about how how quickly we can make sure that we keep you know, new packaging up to date online and how do you keep everything fresh and, you know, it's all part of being automated and, and um, again, it's just don't have, I don't have, I don't have a magic, I don't have the, uh, I don't have all the answers, but, you know, yeah. I, I think for us, we just want any site anybody goes on, if they search, we want to make sure that our products show up that it's the right images, it has the right branding, it has the right messaging. You just want to make sure that anything that the consumer wants to know about your product, you want to make sure that you have it available to them online when they're doing it, right? Because the chance of them probably coming back to look at it again, probably it, it's not going to happen. Yeah, that actually so, is one question that come that came up to say, um, could talk about how the how important brand recognition in regards to search terms are themselves. Um, I know. A lot of work that you do around that I, um i don't but i mean i'm just again thinking as as a shopper you know i have expectations when i go in and i try to shop for something you know i type in a word and i want it to pop up what i think it should be if i have to spend too much time searching for something then i'll just you know i find myself even like well i'll just go to amazon because their search functions are just you know, it, it's just, it's easy. Um, you know, they've, they've, they've got it figured out. They have it mastered. They really do. Yeah. It's all about simplicity and convenience. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, I know, again, I was trying to go on some of my customer sites and just try to shop to see what the e-commerce um, experience is. And, you know, there were some key learnings there. And I think that's something that, that everybody could do is, Customers that you're shopping, you know, that you're calling on, just go on their e-com and type in your items and search and see yeah. what pops up. You know, do your items even pop up? I, you would be surprised how many of your customers you go on the e-commerce and you type in your item and it may not even come up. You know, it's carried in store, but it's not even on their website. So, you know, I think that, you know, that's that's a good starting point. I know that's what I've during this whole mm -hmm. digital. I've been doing a lot of that too, and then working with my customers to make sure that our items get on their e-commerce site. Yeah, that is a very good point. Um, I have not worked client side for 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, when I was at a food and beverage company, my job was to go into stores and make sure that our shelf casings were on and everything yeah. was correct. Yeah. And that same applies today, but it's searching the keywords. Mm-hmm. Great tip. Thank you. Um, looking at the future, uh, where do you see category management and shopper insights <laughs> in the next three to five years? Um, I, I mean, this is my own personal opinion, but I, I think the shelf will probably continue to shrink and skew assortment in brick and mortar will shrink. And then you'll mm-hmm. just have more options online. So if there's things, you know, you know, some of those those items that, you know, maybe you're slower selling instead of tying up inventory and stuff in the stores, you know, I feel like that's a, that's a, an opportunity where they could just ship it and be online. Um, Mm-hmm. I mean, I think, but I think e-com is going to continue to be a bigger and bigger piece of all retailers' business. I, I think it's here to stay. I don't think it's leaving. And, um, you know, I don't think brick and mortar is going away either, right? It's just how do the, you know, the people that will remain strong, it's going to be about how they create that experience in store for folks. Yeah. And then how then do they layer that experience online for that same shopper? So. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Pre pandemic, actually, in the electronics space, Samsung, I believe it's Samsung, um, mm-hmm. has a store in Meatpacking District in Manhattan, does not sell any products whatsoever. But you go in, they have the digital fridge, they have the, the TVs, they have couches. It's like a home when you can literally kind of walk through the home and then you order online and it's delivered. But yeah. it was one of the first, and it was probably two years ago now, but one of the first stores to open that did not sell anything you could not click and collect but it was very busy and yeah and so on um what do you see as the biggest opportunities for kind of for you in your career and i actually have a couple of questions that have come oh, in um one from um someone who's very um junior in their role right now they are just starting out they would love to know a little bit more um around your career, what skill sets may be needed in the future of um, category management, what new kind of tools they have to learn, um, and really how to navigate the next couple of years as our, as our roles change. Um, hmm, hmm. So young in career. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, it, it was just just being eager to learn anything I could and, and just being open to to any and all opportunities don't get fixated on you know i have to take this path you know i I, for me what worked well for me was i did some time in retail so i understand that i've done a buyer role so i understand what it's like to sit behind the desk i've been on the cpg side and then even on this side you know i continue to try to you know any customer i have i try to learn everything there is about that customer um and and always you know you know, I, I yeah, <laughs> just embrace, you know, you'll figure it out, right? You just will figure it out. I have my go-to tools and, and but I'm always open to change, right? I know, you know, I, I can't do the same thing, the same things I did 20 years ago today. I have to pivot and learn and try new things. And um, so, yeah, and just always, you know, I think, you know, like even being with Colgate, you know, I work for Colgate, but whenever I'm in my career with a customer, I always put them first. It's like, okay, I, I mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I had a boss once tell me it was, and I still use this line for, for any category opportunity, you can bring a solution for the company that you work for. With, for. So mm-hmm. always keep the category and the customer in mind, and then you will win. So in in my career i've just you know i've just tried to always be open to new new ideas and and try new tools and learn new things and continue to challenge myself um so even being on you know on the team that i was on for so long i've always learned new things and have opened myself up to just new opportunities and and so yeah i don't know if that answered their question but just be open be open (laughs) yeah you open and stay curious is uh, <laughs> yes yes wonderful and then final question for you so a little bit more tactically um obviously we have a lot of category management and shopper insights professionals on the call today what advice do you have for them for the next six months as we navigate oh. through the latter half <laughs> <of the 2021? laughs> 
Um, you know, the biggest challenge this year is just how we've been trying to anniversary the sales from last year, right? So, you know, we, we yeah. have, you know, we've made it over that big giant mountain and, you know, we're starting to level off. And, and now, you know, as we're going into like line reviews for our customers um, for next year, it's, uh, you know, just really staying on top of, you know, the trends and what's going on and how things are progressing post COVID. And, and um, you know, I, I think e-commerce is, is, you know, we're hearing that that is the buzzword where, you know, make sure you have e-commerce in mind and, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just, <laughs> there's so many challenges right now. It's just, you know, supply chain and, and e-com and, you know, anniversary and COVID and uh, just inventory. People are talking now about inventory and productivity. And I mean, there's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's tough right now, I think. And it's going to be tough the next six months. I do think that the next six months are going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I did see a, a market research meme. Yes, I look at market research memes that had like data tables that were kind of chaos. Yeah, <laughs> sales data that's chaos. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of like, okay, let's put the patterns amongst this, uh, amongst the last 12 months worth of data. So, yeah, I, I mean, it is, it is. I mean, everything is, well, that was COVID last year. Well, that was COVID last year. Well, we had no inventory last year, or, you know, and I think that's just for everybody. So it's, yeah, I think the next six months, you know, well, it, it's still going to be tough, but, but I think we're going to start seeing things start to normalize. Yeah. Yeah. Hang, hang tough and stay strong, everybody. It's going to be yeah. a, a wild ride for the rest of the year. Thank you so much, Charles. It's been absolutely wonderful. It's been so great chatting with you. I'm going to turn it back to Phil now. And I want to say thank you to everyone that attended as well. Um, and Tara and I were blessed to have you all listening to us today. Back over to you, Phil.